We're here to talk about, um, there we go, Bermuda, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, something that uh, loomed large in my life since this is where I came from, this is where I grew up. I'm sure you all know that Bermuda is the second most remote place in the world. No, no. Well, it is, it is. Look at it out there in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, nothing for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Of course, the question that always comes up is, oh yeah? Well, what's the most remote place? Well, guess what? St. Helena. And that's where they banished Napoleon. But Bermuda, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, uh, very hard for people to realize now, was really uh, cut off from the rest of the world, um, not only by distance, but by the fact that there was something called a war on. But for those of us growing up here, when we were kids, we weren't aware of the carnage under the sea. What we were aware of was this incredible environment that we lived in, that uh, where we dove into the water and it was this uh, amazing tropical paradise filled with sea fans and coral and sponges and more fish than you could count. And at night when you jumped into that inky black water and the phosphorescence bubbled up around you and you were coated in stars and you burst up through the surface of the water and the stars in the sky met the stars in the water and you didn't know where one left off and the other began. It was truly a magical place. People ask me, uh, where I learned to draw, and um, I said, well, you know, uh, when uh, one summer up there in the old Hamilton Hotel, up there at the end of uh, Reed Street, there was a guy who had art classes, and I was sent there. The art class basically consisted of him taking some bottles out and putting them on the windowsill, and then uh, he would leave the room, and then an hour later he'd come and collect the bottles, and we'd leave. Each week there were more bottles, <laughs> so I assume he was having a good time. I'm not sure how much we actually learned. My actual art education came around the corner there on Reed Street um, and down Washington Lane, then a little dark alley. I always said that I learned uh, how to draw from Mrs. Birdsey. And uh, people say, you mean, you mean Mr. Birdsey, Alfred Birdsey, the uh, well-known Bermuda painter? No, 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 Mrs. Birdsey, his mother. Down there in Washington Lane, she had a used magazine shop, and I haunted it. For me, that was like kid nirvana, and I'd save my threepenny bits, and down there I'd go, and I'd stock up on the comic books and the magazines that the guys down there at the Naval Base and the Air Force Base brought in and sold for pennies so that I could, uh, I could look at them and learn from them and memorize every line by those wonderful, wonderful artists. Of course, there was also the library, and you know, you could go there and... Uh, you know. <laughs> but... Um, that, that, uh, that certainly occupied my days and, and with that kind of fantasy, but then something else came into my life to occupy the nights. Uh, I had an uncle, an American uncle, who occasionally would come and visit, a man of mystery and great presence, and his uh, visits were always incredibly welcome. And one time when he came, he brought with him a kit out of which he built for me a Halicrafter radio. And now for the first time, late at night, when the sun went down and the atmosphere was exactly right, I could, lying under the sheets at night so no one would know, I could twiddle those dials and yep, in would come America. <laughs> and suddenly my night was filled with other stars, Jack Benny, Groucho Marx, the great Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy and all those wonderful radio dramas like Gunsmoke and Dragnet. One man who I think probably influenced me more than almost any other was the great Stan Freeberg, an amazing uh, comedian who uh, in those high and far off times would parody all of those other people. And I saved more threepences and I went out and I bought his records and I ran them and ran them until they were worn out and was so fascinated by uh, the stories that he told and the characters that he invented that when I heard about this amazing new invention called television, I got a plywood box and I cut a hole in the front and it was the shape of a television set and I made a little puppets that were the characters from the Stan Freeberg records and I put them up in that in that homemade television screen and I pretended that I was on television. Little did I know 
that off in Paris at the same time, the great puppeteer Philippe Gentil was doing the same thing, and over there in Washington, a thousand miles in the other direction, a young guy named Jim Henson, uh, not too many years older than I, was doing exactly the same, miming to Stan Freeberg's records, but doing it to a real audience on real television. And his career was begun and was eventually, of course, to cross mine. But I was bitten by the radio bug and I started hanging out at ZBM, which was then the one uh, station here. And I hung out and hung out until they got tired, I guess, of having me sitting around doing nothing. And they actually gave me a microphone. And um, it, was, it was heaven. It was magic. I think I put, they put me on what they called the garbage shift, which was the best shift of all. I think it was Wednesday nights when we played all of those am amazing records that came in from the BBC transcription service. And the second chapter of my education began listening to Basil Rathbone doing Sherlock Holmes, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, and of course, most delirious and most amazing of all, Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, and the goons. What, what an incredible education they were in every respect. I went from there on to college, and from, in college I basically majored in the humor magazine, and I took that um, important bit of education and took it into publishing, uh, into the world of children's books, which seemed to be a very natural progression, and there I became at Random House the editor and art director of the Beginner Book Division, uh, which had been founded by a guy named Ted Geisel, whom you all know as Dr. Seuss, uh, working uh, under the biggest and most glamorous hat ever invented. The, um, one of the, 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 the great American artists, um, Chuck Close, when somebody asked him where he found his inspiration, he snorted back, inspiration is for amateurs. <laughs> and boy, do I agree with that. The story of how uh, Ted Geisel invented the cat in the hat is, I think, a perfect example of that uh, when the Russians sent Sputnik up and it was going beep, 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 beep around the world and Americans were there qui quivering in, in, in anger, fear, and envy. And everyone was saying, what is going on here? How is it that the Russians are so far ahead? And John Hersey wrote a major piece in Life magazine entitled, uh, Why is it Ivan can read and Johnny can't? Is it because our school books are so boring? Why isn't it that one of America's great children's authors like Dr. Seuss uh, doesn't write a primer for children to make reading more fun? And Ted went, hmm. Oh, well, that's an interesting idea. And this guy, who usually turned out at least two books a year, uh, went away and he took this very complex formula, the, uh, the speech, the Dale Chawl speech readability formula, which gives you a certain number of words that you can use in certain contexts and sentence lengths and so forth, and locked himself away for a year and a half. And after he had filled many wastebaskets with discards, emerged with the cat in the hat. And he changed, I think, uh, the way kids learn to read for millions forever. At that same time, um, being in publishing, I was very interested to hear about a new project that was just uh, beginning uh, called Sesame Street, and it sounded like something that we might be interested in, and I got in touch with them and very soon found myself as the editor and art director of uh, Sesame Street books at Random House, doing a lot of uh, illustration for these books, and that in turn put me in touch with a guy named Jim Henson. Uh, he whose uh, life had so curiously paralleled mine so many years before. And uh, Jim started twisting my arm and would I come and design some characters for him. Well, that was just too delicious an idea. And out of that came Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem Band uh, for the Muppets. Uh, a, um, a partner for uh, Kermit the Frog and Fozzie Bear and pigs, 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 so many pigs, some of whom went on to become uh, rather major stars. The Muppet Show, <laughs> which had been turned down by every network in America, <coughs> was being produced in England. Lord Grade saw this as an interesting uh, project, an opportunity, and it had become truly the most uh, successful television show in the world. Hard to believe that these little puppets had achieved such fame. <clears throat> but right there, at the very peak of uh, The Muppet Show's success, Jim decided that um, it was time to move on, that he wanted to try other things, he wanted to make movies, and uh, so he was going to go off and do that. Well, what would all of us who'd been working in this world of television be doing? And he called us to London, where the show was produced, and uh, he said, um, I'd like you to think about um, how to create a show for kids 
that will save the world? Well, a modest, a <laughs> modest challenge. <clears throat> so three of us, um, he gave us his house in London to work in, and three of us, Jerry Jewell, our head writer, and Jocelyn Stevenson, who had written for the Sesame Street Publications, and I, took over Jim's house and began uh, trying to figure out what we might do to save the world with a television show. It began rather modestly. This is one of my first sketches from a meeting we actually had in a hotel in London um, with um, the idea that these were little characters who lived uh, behind the walls and, I don't know, came out and stole your teaspoons or something. And as it progressed, we, we began to think more and more about how we could expand this world into what would become the world of Fraggle Rock. And as I kept drawing and doodling and noodling and scribbling, there, the world behind the baseboard and whatever house this was became a little more interesting. Uh, tunnels began to develop and what looked like uh, distant caves with stalactites and stalagmites. And uh, Jocelyn, who was working with me, looked over my shoulder and said, where the heck did that come from? And I said, well, you know, I think it comes from here. <laughs> when I was a kid, one of the stories that was most exciting, most electrifying, most fascinating and mysterious was that story of the two little boys who were playing cricket out there on the East End. And one of them hit the ball and the ball rolled away. It bounded across the grass and down into a hole. And well, you couldn't let a cricket ball just go. So they went home and they got a torch and they came back and they shone the torch into the hole. And it went on and on and they followed and followed, hoping to find the cricket ball. And suddenly it opened up and there they were in what we now know as Crystal Cave. And so that became, for me, the world of Fraggle Rock. The characters themselves began to evolve. At first, they were these little furry creatures. Uh, then they began to take on personalities, and they found professions. Um, and as we developed the characters themselves, we got to know more about them and who they were. And finally, one day, I sat and I scribbled these little doodles on a yellow pad because I finally knew just who these characters were. And this is what they became. <clears throat> In the center there is Gobo, the leader, the adventurer who represents that part of our spirit. And surrounding him are Moki, the, uh, the artist and the dreamer, Red, who is the, uh, the energetic, athletic one, Wembley, who can never make up his mind about anything, and Boober, for whom life is all about death and laundry. <laughs> now, when people talk to me about Fraggle Rock, they say, oh, 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 I love Wembley. He's so adorable. He's so cute. I want to pull him and hug him. Oh, Boober is so funny. Uh, Red is so full of, oh, I was always an artist. Moki is my hero. And you can tell right away a lot about that person from which of these different characters they identify with. But the fact is that they're really identifying with the whole group and what that whole group personifies when it all comes together. And they did come together in the great Fraggle Cave. Over there is the Fraggle Horn that would summon all the Fraggles together. Again, memories of my childhood lying in bed and listening to the sound of the fishermen with their conch shells across the water, bringing everybody together when the fresh fish came in. The Fraggles um, were very high energy. They danced and sang all day, as you know, except when they took these frequent uh, Fraggle naps. And, uh, when they did nap like that, they became uh, sometimes uh, entangled in the work of some of the other characters who lived in Fraggle Rock, in this case, the Doozers, who uh, obviously the Fraggles had not heard Raditha's talk. Um, the Fraggles looked upon as being about as interesting as a bunch of termites. Um, they were builders, like the termites, uh, but um, for the Fraggles, they were you know, just there to kind of uh, be part of the scenery and were basically dismissed. But one of the things that we wanted to do in this show that was supposed to save the world was to talk to kids about the differences in cultures and the differences in backgrounds and the different ways that people lived in this world. That people um, of no matter how different their, uh, their ethnicities, their uh, races, their uh, geography, their nationalities, their religion, whatever it may be, we are all completely interdependent. We all rely on each other, and that most of the conflicts that happen in the world happen through misunderstanding. And one of the very conscious things in the world of Fraggle Rock is there are no villains. 
You can love the gorgs as much as you love the doozers, as much as you love the fraggles or Sprocket the dog who lives upstairs in our real world. The other characters, of course, were the giant gorgs. And again, each of these characters was very, very different in its design uh, of a purpose so that you could tell them apart right away and know what each one was in its own way, where the fraggles were hunter-gatherers, the doozers were manufacturers and builders, and the gorgs were basically farmers. They imagined themselves to be the rulers of the universe, but um, since they were the only ones out there, they didn't have a lot of competition in that uh, <laughs> department. And finally, another character um, who uh, I dearly loved, and that's Marjorie the Trash Heap. She first appeared <laughs> In uh, the tenth year of Sesame Street, Sesame Street asked us if we would come up with some new characters. And uh, I always loved the fact that when archaeologists go to a new site, one of the first things they look for is not the temple or the palace, but the dump. You can find out more from a dump about a, about a culture than you can from all the temples and palaces combined. So the idea that a trash heap would be a repository of wisdom, that just seemed a natural. So when I took this to Sesame Street, um, well, you know, um, they, didn't, they didn't quite see the wisdom in it. And uh, Marjorie went into a drawer for a couple of years. And when Fraggle Rock came around, uh, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And out came Marjorie, and she became one of our favorite characters in Fraggle Rock. <laughs> to connect this Fraggle world with our world, uh, we came up with a character named Doc who lived uh, out, uh, upstairs, outside, beyond the Fraggle hole in his, uh, in his baseboard. And um, he is an eccentric tinkerer, inventor, who had this wonderful dog named Sprocket. Sprocket is the only one who understands that there are Fraggles back there behind the board, but, uh, the baseboard, but because um, you know, he can only talk in woofs and barks, he can't quite communicate this to Doc. But uh, what a wonderful duo Doc and Sprocket were. And this is the world of the Fraggles uh, with the Gorg Castle over there, uh, down here in the corner, Marjorie the Trash Heap. In the center, the center of the universe, Fraggle Rock at the Gorg's Well, and up there, Sprocket the Dog and Gobo Fraggle. And of course, one of the wonderful things about doing this show was that as the Fraggles uh, explored their world, more and more incredible characters were needed. And so week after week, I got to design character after character after character. And our amazing, amazing shop of builders came up with just the most incredible puppets time after time after time. It was such a joy to work on. This is another of uh, my very favorite guys. This is uh, a little homage to my, to my distant uh, uncle with uh, his messages from across the sea. This is traveling Matt Fraggle, uh, Gobo's uncle. And Matt is an intrepid explorer. He is the first one to leave Fraggle Rock and go out through the Fraggle Hole to explore the world of the silly creatures. That's us. <laughs> and send postcards back to Gobo. Uh, explaining to him uh, what was going on out here in our world. So this gave us another connection that tied all of these different and disparate worlds together. We went down to uh, Crystal Cave last summer and um, it was given, we were given a tour by Colin Otterbridge who has been uh, uh, the tour guide down there I think practically since the inception of Fraggle Rock. And when I saw Colin I thought, there's something going on here I think. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful guy, and if you get a chance to go down there, I, I hope you have Colin as your guide. Uh, in Bermuda, you couldn't help but grow up very, very uh, aware of how connected everything in nature is. Um, lying in bed at night and listening to the music of the water going down through the pipes from the roof into the tank below, you really uh, understood how critical that whole water cycle and water system is. Uh, our only fresh water coming from the, from the heavens. And, uh, and so the water cycle became the center for all of Fraggle Rock. Uh, there was a, um, in the middle of Fraggle Rock, the Fraggle Pond. And from that, the gorgs drew their water to water their garden. The garden nourished the radishes, which were the food for the fraggles and the building materials for the doozers. Um, when the well began to run dry, the, uh, the sacred order of pipe bangers would go and bang on a pipe that was outside of, uh, of Doc's workshop. And Doc, thinking that there was something wrong with his radiator, would uh, fiddle with the valves. And uh, when the water started to flow into the, um, 
Fraggle Pond. Of course, the Fraggles thought the gods had answered their prayers, and Doc simply thought that he'd fix the radiator. Um, I have a feeling that's kind of the way things really work, you know. <laughs> Um, but it really did give us a, a sense of this cycle and how all of these different worlds were so interdependent on each other, so connected uh, in, a, in a place where none of these characters and creatures understood this in the least. And we hope that the kids who were watching this show would come away with it with some sense of um, how they themselves were an essential part of this world in which we live.